Assalamualaikum and welcome to our program on Ahlul Bayt TV in a week that we are calling Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny week. And I want to send congratulations, Mubarak, to everyone tuning in uh, on this program in this week where we are remembering the birth of the blessed holy prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny. And inshallah, the programs throughout this week uh, will be, of course, discussing the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, looking at his personality and his life from various angles. Uh, so tonight we're going to be exploring uh, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny as a model of ethics, as a model of uh, perfect uh, behavior and, uh, and character and looking at his mission uh, as he said that he only came to perfect the, the morals and ethics uh, of humanity. And uh, asking whether our ethics and morals have gone on a de decline even in recent uh, years in the Muslim community and in the world in general, and uh, what we can do to turn back to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny to refresh and remind ourselves um, of his personality so that we can model ourselves uh, upon that. And uh, my guest is Sayyid Zafra Bas, who is going to, inshallah, be uh, answering some of my questions on this topic. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaamu Alaikum. And uh, thank you again for giving us your, your time uh, in the middle of your very busy schedule for this thank you. important subject. Um, so, looking at the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his holy progeny, um, as an embodiment of, of practical ethics, um, I mean, we use the word akhlaq a lot, and perhaps we, we don't always understand the full meaning of the word akhlaq. Uh, I mean, here it has been translated, or it's often translated as ethics. Um, but I was going to ask, is it something more than ethics? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala tayyibin al I also would like to offer congratulations to you and to all our viewers uh, on this uh, auspicious uh, holy month of the Holy Prophet of Islam and his grandson Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. Uh, and may this month and these days uh, be blessed for all of us, inshallah. Um, I think when when talking about akhlaq and akhlaq in reality is a very important uh, topic uh, with regards to um, to everything in our lives. Um, it's very interesting that um, when we go to our Islamic seminaries, um, when when we enter there, the one of the first topics that we're taught is akhlaq. Um, in in the sense and the the point being behind that is that um, before you can learn anything else, you have to learn uh, how to behave um, with people. Um, so akhlaq, and, and we translate it as ethics or behavior or so on and so forth. But I think um, all of these, we, we have limitations in the English language in terms of how, you know, whether one word can describe something like mm -hmm. akhlaq. But the, the way that, um, that, that the ulama of akhlaq, the, those who have written comments and, and, and commentaries on, on this topic of akhlaq, have described it as, as if um, the way that we behave or what we do are the fruits of the tree. But akhlaq is the, is the, the whole process right. of planting the seed and then watering the seed and making sure that the soil is right. And from the moment that tr seed grows all the way up to it becoming a tree and then producing fruit. So all this whole process is what they, um, is what they use to describe akhlaq. That it is the way, it is the whole entire conduct of how I live my life. And for that reason, Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first of all says to us um, in Surah Al-Azab that for, uh, the messenger of Allah is the best example and for the Holy Prophet of Islam and his own conduct he says in Surah Al-Qalam 
that um, we have made you, uh, we have granted you the station of being the most perfect when it comes to khulq, when it comes to behaving mm. with people. So, if we want to understand akhlaq, there's no other way other than to look at the seerat, the sunnah and the way and the practice and the example of the Holy Prophet of Islam. So that means that the Holy Prophet of Islam's whole life, everything that he did in his life, that is, in practical terms, what akhlaq is. So that means that, um, for example, and akhlaq is, of course, the first step towards more spiritual uh, stations yeah. of perfection of whether we um, we might call those higher stages of ma'rifa or irfan or so on and so forth but it this this gives us an insight that there's no there's no ma'rifa and there's no irfan and there's no akhlaq without following the sharia you know there's some yeah. misguided forms of uh, groups of people who come forward and for example state that there's no need for yeah. Uh, for to for us to follow Sharia because we've reached this stage and this level where we we don't need to uh, you know do the follow these rules, but the Holy Prophet of Islam embodies his his whole life embodies in this way that he uh, lives the Sharia he breathes the Sharia he, walk, he do, everything he does is is of course that becomes the Sharia, and he is the best example, so that means that any such uh, sort of thought is a misguided thought away from what the Holy Prophet Islam and of course by extension his holy progeny yeah. have taught. Um, therefore akhlaq is sort of really akhlaq is when we say Islam is a way of life what we mean is this akhlaq is should be in Islam our way of life the way that we behave because this is how the Holy Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, and his holy progeny um, Behaved, and as you mentioned, the hadith, the Holy Prophet said, that the re the only reason in Nama here denotes exclusivity. That the only reason that I have come is to uh, perfect people's akhlaq, to reach that highest level of akhlaq. That means that akhlaq encompasses yeah. every single aspect of our life, even those things which perhaps we don't associate with akhlaq. For example, we don't associate war with akhlaq, or we don't associate justice with akhlaq, or we don't associate, I don't know, um, you know, uh, table manners or, you know, bathroom manners with akhlaq. Yeah. But Holy Prophet Islam is saying all of these things are part of akhlaq. These, all these things together make up akhlaq. And in all of those things, you will follow, find in Rasulullah and the Holy Salam, the best example, the mm. best way of mm -hmm. how to. Thank you. I mean, uh, another thing, of course, is uh, as we're encouraged to look at his, uh, his seerah or um, his way, his way of life, his biography. Um, and again, of course, there are many biographies out there. And as I have learned over the years, um, that some of the, the details of, the, of his biography uh, were composed during the Abbasid era and um, or let's say written down during the Abbasid era and um, that you know some people have said that there are certain narrations about him in fact there are many narrations about him um, that were you know fabricated or invented or used also to justify the conduct of Bani Ume and Bani Abbas um, so before we kind of talk about, you know, how we look at his akhlaq, we have to first uh, kind of consider what sources we turn to, because um, many people will just be picking up, you know, Absolutely. different bi biographies. Absolutely. Is, is there a biography you can recommend? I mean, uh, absolutely, it is, this is a, it is a real, a real problem, and yes, that is the reality of, of how history of Islam has developed, that uh, prior to um, the end, or towards the end of the Abbasid era really, um, they were talking about the, the time of our 11th Imam and the beginning of Ghibat of our 12th Holy Imam, um, is when the, uh, the way and the conduct of, or the, the, this practice of writing things down came about. You know, before mm -hmm. this, uh, you know, there was an oral tradition 
from Ahlul Bayt al and and this is perhaps a reason why we emphasize, continue to emphasize on the importance of Ahlul Bayt al mm -hmm. um, in order to find out real, true, authentic information about the Holy Prophet yeah. um, We have a saying, we're saying in Arabic that you know the, the people of the house. Um, know better about about the house, of yeah. course, um, and therefore uh, we we rely on the narrations from Ahlul Bayt Alaihissalam regarding the Holy Prophet of Islam, um, and they they told us what they told us what either what the Holy Prophet of Islam said, or what the Holy Prophet of Islam used to do, or what they and what he used to how he used to conduct himself, and how the Imam Alaihi Wasallam conducted himself was exactly in the way, yeah. or nobody followed the Holy Prophet of Islam in the way that Ayman did so. So many of those uh, narratives and anecdotes regarding the Holy Prophet Islam, regarding his life, come from, our, in our sources, come from the Ayman who, who tell us that the Holy Prophet Islam, for example, Amir al says, the Holy Prophet Islam told me this, or Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain say, the Holy Prophet Islam told me this, yeah or they, 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 he did this, or later Imams also say, and then people challenge them and say, how, how can you say that Rasulullah said this? And the Imam would say, look, my father told me, his father told me, his father, and so on and so forth. Well-known narrations regarding, for example, from Imam Sadiq, from Imam Raza salam, and later Imams as well. In any case, the, the, the way into the, the, the biography and the life of the Holy Prophet Islam is through Ahlul Bayt al um, There is no... Uh, Sunnah of the Holy Prophet Islam that is not exemplified in the life mm -hmm. of one of the Ayyam and uh, nobody lived their lives in the way that Ayyam Salam lived their lives following Holy Prophet Islam. So that is, that's uh, one. And yes, this is a challenge, this is a problem. The way to identify it though is of course to look at number one, how does the Holy Quran De, uh, define and exemplify the Holy Prophet yeah. of Islam, and then to look at how the Imam Islam lived their lives, and then see if there's if there seems to be some kind a story that seems to be in con contradiction or not quite right compared to what the Holy Quran is saying, compared to how the Imam Islam lived their life, then it means that that story is not one that uh, that can be relied upon, because when Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says. He's the best example. That means that he is the best example yeah. for all times, not just for his time, not just for that particular group of people, not just for that particular area of people. No, he's, he is the best example for all of us. Yeah. Whosoever desires Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the last day, he is the best example for them. So whoever is concerned about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me, and how I'll be held accountable in the last day, we'll find in Rasulullah the best example. That means that any uh, thing that would go against him being the best example or would show him in a light that would, would prove that he's not the best example has to be at least set aside, mm -hmm. if not, uh, you know, if not, we, if we're not, we, for us to say that it is to be rejected outright. But at least it is not something that we can give importance to when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying that He is the best example uh, in all aspects for all people for all times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so people wanting to learn about his personality and his character also uh, need to, you know, conduct investigation. Uh, themselves uh, as well. Everyone needs to educate um, themselves and learn as best as, as possible. Um, and uh, so looking at um, this idea of uh, akhlaq, as you said earlier, that we don't often associate akhlaq or, or good character with uh, justice um, or with, uh, as you know, we've got other areas, economics and politics. Um, but uh, looking at the narrations in the sources, you can see that this was something that did characterize the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and um, the Ahlul Bayt, alayhum salam, that you know, people would come to them with an issue, and they always gave a balanced and just um, response, or they dealt with the issue in a balanced and just way.
way. Um, so if we're looking at... Our condition today, um, you know, followers trying to be followers of the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. And I think it's hopeless. We could start by looking at our ourselves, um, looking at our families, or sort of on a small scale, looking at our schools uh, or in our workplace, and reflecting on our own conduct or reflecting on how we can reform the conduct in our in our own. Area. I don't I think, know what you. Yeah, no, I think I think first, firstly, and 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 this is a, a point that I believe I've made before as well, but it's, it's worth repeating. Um, and that is that we have this the life of the Holy Prophet of Islam divided into two broad, broadly into two parts. We have the life of forty years, which is prior to his announcement of prophethood. And then we have 23 years, uh, 13 years in Mecca and 10 years in Medina, um, of his prophethood, you know, of his uh, of his preaching, um, and we often focus on these on these 23 years, yeah. um, from age 40 through till the moment he passes away, and we look at it and we study it and we hear about it in significant detail, but we don't focus on the 40 years. Um, before prophethood. Could I, yes. could I just cut you there? We just, yes. We've just got a call of it's just come in. Sorry to... Uh, no uh, uh, So, Salaam welcome. Salaam I think I might have put the phone down. If you did just call in, please do call back. There may be a couple... Uh, yes. Salaam Rebecca, I wanted to mention that see, even in... What I find for young people and for grown-ups as well, what's sad about this end time, well, I don't know if it was back then as well, but everything's just getting sexualised and it's becoming corruption and it's encouraged to do bad things and it's not, they don't value, society doesn't value marriage anymore and it's not respect for women. Yeah. And um, I also feel like as if it's not values there at all and it's like, as if you're encouraged to do bad things, and it just makes me sad that that's the situation for young people that are, even for adults, it's just like whatever you turn on in TV is something that you think can make those minds and turn it over. It's like, it's just become, it's, I just think respect is dying now, and yeah. um, even some people can laugh at children as if it's, a, if it's okay to laugh at children in a, in a bad way, and it's like the pizza gate thing as well that's happening just now, it's just, it's a lot of psychopaths and pedophiles out there and yeah. um, video killers and, and that's why our Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him wanted values because otherwise humans can behave like beasts and then um, that's where the corruption comes in. Yeah. You know, and I do believe it's not only the devil and humans as beasts when they don't behave, it is something other than, it's evil, like, I don't know if it's Gog and Magog, and other stuff, you know, it's something that's very evil that's happening just now in the world. That's what I wanted to mention as well. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, sister, for calling in. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose we can talk in a, um, in a, in a theoretical way, um, said Zafar. Um, but as we know, uh, especially with the type of media we've got today and many parents will be watching, um, who, you know, they're trying to raise their children in a very toxic um, environment. Uh, as the sister said, actually, you know, we're living in a culture where people are encouraged to do, to do the opposite. They're encouraged to do bad. Um, and, and this is something that I've observed, you know, over the years in the popular culture, that someone starts off quite innocent and then somewhere along the line, you know, it's like, well, now I've turned bad, and it's kind of like, this is this pop singer's big kind of moment of becoming bad. Um, and there's a kind of cynicism towards uh, innocence and, and being good. And children learn that attitude from a very young age, which is, which is quite disturbing. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting. I was actually um, just about to come right. to that, which uh, is it's nice that it's been raised. Um, so as I said, um, this period of 
the 40 years of the Holy Prophet Islam's life are really the time and the the, the period of the Holy Prophet Islam's life which we uh, don't really focus on, we, we don't really examine it, we don't really uh, look at that part of the Holy Prophet Islam's life, um, we don't give it as much importance yeah. as we give to the 23 years that come afterwards. H however, it is actually this part of the Holy Prophet Islam's life which perhaps in some way, in some can give us some direction of how we should be living our lives today. Why? Because um, we are living, as you said, toxic times in a difficult situation, a, a time where evil is very prevalent, wrong doing is encouraged, uh, to do the right thing is tough, it is discouraged, people are made fun of, mockery, so on and so forth. And this is almost identical to the time where the Holy Prophet Islam lived his life, right. prior to his announcement of Prophet. And in that time, it wasn't just the Holy Prophet of Islam, but it was the, all, of, all, the, all his family members around him. So his uncle and his grandfather and his other uncles and so on and so forth. And you know, this whole group of people from Bani Hashim who also had this... Uh, you know, akhlaq and character and way to deal with people and so on and so forth, that even those people who were of a different faith or, you know, didn't accept their faith still acknowledged that these people are superior to us in terms of their own moral conduct, their own akhlaq. So that part of the Holy Prophet Islam's life is perhaps in some ways the way for us to find, to examine, to look at and see that, look, if in that period of time you're living in the society, you're interacting with mm -hmm. that society, you're meeting the people, you're not, it's not as if we, the Holy Prophet had secluded himself from the society, you know, he still lived in the society, he still interacted with people, yet in that evil uh, time he managed to uphold his akhlaq. Uh, and that is, that's, it is, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. But that is what the Holy Prophet Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects from the Ummah of the Holy Prophet Islam as well. That even if you're living in a difficult time, even if you're living in a difficult place, uh, where it is a challenge, there's no, there's no two ways about, yeah. uh, about, about this particular issue. It is a challenge. There's, there's no getting away from it. Um, wherever we go, and as days go by, it becomes more and more challenging. The challenge increases. Mm. So we have to rise to the challenge and say that, yes, we do have an example of the Holy Prophet of Islam spending his years, 40 years of his life in this kind of a place and showing us how, how, how practically how to do it. Yeah. Um, how to maintain your akhla, how to behave with other people, how to, uh, irrespective of um, beliefs, get people to acknowledge that you are superior to them morally. Because the title of Sadiq and Amin was given to the Holy Prophet Islam in the pre-Islamic time, not yeah. in the, uh, after the announcement of Prophet, in, in the pre-Islamic pre, uh, pre, uh, announcement of Prophet of Time, this 40 years of the Holy Prophet of Time. So that means that the two conduct values that people would acknowledge even if they didn't agree with your beliefs are not telling a lie yeah. and being trustworthy with people. So that means that these are conducts, these are things that we speak about very easily but really embody in our lives and to, for us to uh, do a muhasaba you know, an examination of our day and think, you know, was I truthful yeah. th for the whole day? Did I, in every single moment in my life, whether it was my personal life, whether it was in my, in, 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 in my work, in my friends, was I honest with everyone? Mm. And was I trustworthy with everyone? And then think about how to rise to this challenge. Yeah, so that's, again, good points. Uh, if we're thinking about, you know, it just seems so overwhelming with um, the amount of corruption that's going on uh, around us and uh, just uh, the sheer number of causes that 
uh, you know, we could potentially join. Um, but still, the work that we could do, as you say, is reflection on, on our own conduct um, and just reflection on those around us on a day-to-day -day level and not to um, underestimate that. Because I think also some people, um, they do join causes and, uh, and movements and political movements. Um, but the akhlaq issue does get overlooked quite often. You know, people become very passionate about uh, an idea or a philosophy um, to the point that, you know, as we very well know, they start attacking uh, other people um, in um, unpleasant ways, uh, you know, in, in their kind of battle for the cause. And in a way, there's just, uh, they're going against the whole purpose of, why they're joining this call. So it's better actually to focus upon um, one's own conduct, um, as you say, being truthful, being just, um, and being just to those who are, who are around us. We're just going to uh, go to break, and inshallah we will continue with the program. Do feel free to call in with your thoughts um, on the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny, what we can still learn from him in this day and age. Inshallah we'll be back in a few minutes. Muhammad, and welcome back to Ahlul Bayt live on Ahlul Bayt TV, where we are remembering the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny uh, in a week uh, of remembering. Um, his birth and of course remembering his life as well and uh, reflecting upon uh, how we can refresh our knowledge of his behavior his akhlaq and how we can put that into uh, into practice in our daily lives um, so um, said Zafar Abbas I was going to also say that um, like you say we, we need to engage in uh, muhasaba reflecting upon um, you know, weighing up of our own behavior at the end of the day, um, correcting, um, you know, anything that we think um, is not, you know, could, you know, do with some improvement is not quite up to the, up to the mark. Um, I was going to say that, you know, that the correct behavior that the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam had um, in all of these circumstances, of course, meant that they had awareness of what was the correct behavior and again thinking about so many parents raising their children in a society of many mixed messages um, and you know mixed morals um, mixed types of behaviors um, how can um, parents as an example uh, or even even us you know ourselves um, you know not get um, led astray or confused by these mixed morals? How can the parents raise their children to be aware of what is the correct conduct? As, as, I've, as I've already said, it is, it is uh, without a shadow of doubt, a very big challenge mm. to, for, for all of us, particularly for parents, but for, for re in reality for all of us uh, in terms of... Uh, but um, as we said earlier, the, the first thing is is learning, reflecting over the life of the Holy Prophet Islam, of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salatu um, Because when we uh, go towards the ilm of akhlaq, we read that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created human beings with different capabilities that uh, if they uh, go to any extreme, then they will become corrupted. Mm -hmm. But when they find the right, the right balance with those capabilities, that person will become successful and rise through the ranks of Akhla. So the, for, as far as Akhla is concerned, it is necessary for the Akhla to go towards perfection through knowledge and as a result of knowledge to reach wisdom, to reach Hikmah. Um, the person who reaches Hikmah has reach perfection in in the matter of intellect, in the matter of aql. Um, because either a person would remain ignorant. Yeah. If a person remains ignorant, then there's no way of getting to, to hikmah. But even if a person becomes knowledgeable, so they learn certain things, but they don't 
have the or they don't reach the wisdom of what to do with their knowledge, how to use it, how not to use it, how to where must it be used, where must one speak, where must one remain silent, so on and so forth. The hikmah would not be reached. So this is this is the uh, in terms of the faculty of of intellect in the way that yeah. intellect does it. Then there's capabilities that are to do with our desires or which are uh, related to our desires. The first one, of course, is the capability of ghadab, of anger. And this is necessary, as we've mentioned before. This is necessary. We, we think of anger as a negative. But this is necessary because if it was not for anger, then we would not feel anything when, it, for example, injustice is happening, we wouldn't feel angry. We wouldn't feel that, you know, if wrongdoing was happening, we would not feel bad about those things if we did not have this faculty. <laughs> But anger has to be channeled in the p correct way for it to be considered courage. Otherwise, it will be considered foolishness. So that is the perfection of anger or the faculty of anger to get towards courage, to get towards shudat. And then when it comes to the faculty of desire of shahwat, of desires of our carnal desires, if you like, mm -hmm. is to get to ifa, is to get to... Uh, purity that person fulfills their desires in the halal manner and way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered them to do so, whether that's to do with eating or drinking or to do with marital relations, for example. So, uh, with all of these, a, per a person who is able to accomplish perfection or re strive towards or reach towards perfection in these areas will be a person who is really getting akhlaq from all angles mm -hmm. in their life. Um, and yes, it is a challenge, there's no doubt about it, uh, because the mediums that are accessible to us now and the fact that they're instant makes it more challenging. Yeah. In the past, if an evil was happening in a particular part of the world or in a particular place, it would have remained limited to that place. Yeah. Nowadays, that evil is broadcasted all over the world, even if it's not on media, it's on social media, and if it's not on social media, it's definitely uh, being passed around through messages to yeah. one another. So all of a sudden, something's happened somewhere, uh, you know, 5,000 miles away, and I know about it straight away. Uh, and then that evil is now being spread out because we're sending the message to other people, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's an encouragement of... So on and so forth. Now everything is on the phone, we ex we're able to ac access everything on the phone, we're able to access things more easily, more quickly, more... And yeah. there are benefits to these things, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a negative, you know, today, if I want to find a reference to something, I can just um, open up my app which has all the books in it and I can look for the reference rather than having to wade through all different kinds of books. So yeah. there's definitely positives in that as well. But from the negative point of view, it means that evil is spread more quickly so we have to be vigilant of that. We have to be wise. This is why hikmah is necessary. We have to be wise in how we spread the messages. Mm. If, we give it, if we give oxygen of publicity to such evil, then we are part of the problem. We are yeah. becoming part of the problem because we're spreading such messages or we don't know whether this message is true or not, but we just sent it to people. We don't know whether the message is helpful or whether it's going to be harmful to people, but we, we sent it anyway. Yeah. No, pause for a moment and think that is this message harmful, is this message beneficial, is this message true, is this message going to be a message that will be constructive or is it going to be destructive and if I pause and reflect on it then half the messages that I just go press forward and send I would not, I would think no, I don't know if this is true or not. Yeah. I don't know if this is going to be beneficial. It, in fact, it may well be harmful. It may not be true. It might be something that, you know, is unnecessary for this. If, if, if all my friends or every group that I'm in doesn't know about it, will, they, will this add something to their life? If not, then why am I sending it? Mm. So, so that is, that's one aspect. Of course, the aspect of being out in the, in the world, being uh, in front of the TV, or so on and so forth, are also challenges. But in this respect, then, yes, parents have a very important role, particularly. Each, each, every one of us has an important role, but parents particularly have an important role. Because um, if the foundations and the beginnings and the grounding and of people growing up in the house when they're young is strong, 
then whatever challenges they will come across, they will be able to deal with those challenges yeah. because the grounding is good. So it's the responsibility of the parents to make sure that the grounding is good. Yes, of course, there's no guarantee even after that that they will not be affected by a negative. But responsibility is to provide them with the grounding so that at least, at least as a result of being provided with that grounding, they are, you know, um, able to 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 get to get to to have that basic grounding in order to know right and wrong mm -hmm. to for their own conscience to be able to speak to them and say that no this path that I'm going to take it will be short term it will give me some benefit but long term I will regret uh, yeah. doing this action or going to this place or going with this person so if the grounding is good then a person will be able to reflect on it more easily and and be able to make better choices that doesn't mean that every time a person is going to make the right choice people will make wrong choices we make we all make wrong choices at some point in our lives um, but the key is that if a person is grounded in the in the basics in the actual meaning of what it is to to do something not just oh i prayed because you know this yeah. is what i had to do or i felt like it was i was dropping an obligation but whether i reflected over what did i do and i saw the importance and the priority that faith had uh, for my parents and therefore i reflected over that yeah. that yes if it's something important for my parents then it should be something important for me Whereas if I'm seeing in my house that it is not something important for my parents, then why would I think it is something important for me? Mm -hmm. So parents have an important role in their own action and also providing grounding for to be able to deal with the challenges that are outside in the world. I was going to say, um, do, you, do you think that sometimes perhaps families or parents or, you know, relatives are sometimes naive about the the kind of hidden messages or hidden influences of media upon children so you know they may want to raise the children you know knowing Islam and and you know with a good frame framework but at the same time like you say they'll be attending events where um, uh, uh, you know there's there's things going on uh, that, that are not you know acceptable in Islam or you know they'll put something on TV that is actively promoting you know again kind of materialistic values or commercial values um, or you know this uh, whole obsession with fame now that we've got um, in our society or even kind of eating food products that um, are manufactured by um, companies that are acting unjustly elsewhere so I was thinking that um, turning back to the Holy Prophet peace be upon him and his progeny that he reformed his society through akhlaq. So if we're thinking, what is the purpose and or a further purpose of me perfecting my akhlaq, it's also not just that, um, you know, I behave well, but it's also to reform, you know, what is around me. You know, absolutely. it's not just to be a nice person, it's no. to actually... A know. Absolutely, and, and, and akhlaq isn't just being a nice person. Mm. Akhlaq is sometimes, um, how should we say, you know, to do the right thing yeah and maybe uh, in some circles in some places as you as you've as you said um, uh, doing the right thing might not make you the night per nice person it might make you a bad person in, in yeah. that in that scenario but it's about doing the right thing so akhlaq isn't just being nice to everyone akhlaq is is as you said to uh, and as the as we know the holy prophet Islam reflected and uh, you know reflected that akhlaq into changing his society and making it better meant that some people didn't like him yeah um that means that yes akhlaq is about you know dealing with people speak speaking with people so on and so forth how you speak how you deal with people how you behave with them but also to do the right thing yeah. Right now, obviously, again, it is still a fine line. Doing the right thing doesn't give me a license to then go all out and leave my uh, character and morals at the door if just because I'm trying to do the right thing. Yeah. As you mentioned, you know, sometimes we go a bit uh, 
overzealous in our in our pursuit for you know justice or in our pursuit for for you know attending some kind of protest or something like that still that doesn't mean i have to i i because i've gone so far in that that i can leave you know behaving yeah. nice but that my objective in akhlaq isn't to please the people it's to please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala yeah because if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased then even if anybody else is not pleased it's no problem but if people are pleased and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes this pleased then uh, you know there will be no uh, you know benefit to me from that real term benefit in terms of uh, hereafter in terms of uh, even this life um from from such 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 a behavior so akhlaq really the priority as we said you know the the fruit of akhlaq is the way that i behave with other people yeah but the root and the basis of akhlaq is how i behave in order to please allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to make sure that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with me in this behavior mm-hmm. with this way and in order to do that we have to reflect over the life of the holy prophet Islam, because he's the best example of the best example of living my life in pleasing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm-hmm. in obeying allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there's nobody who's done that more more, more or better than the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's why we uh, are reflecting over his life and reflecting over these 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 points mm-hmm. thank you also i was going to say of course that you know we're living in a society where um and probably there's always been um ways of wasting time um but uh, you know sometimes people can again kind of just be engaged in entertainment or you know a lot of chatting online or shopping or you know and and in some ways um there isn't that kind of uh, awareness of what it takes to reach this level of akhlaq that we've been talking about where we attain wisdom hikmah um uh so i mean again another thing is that perhaps uh many you know members of the of the muslim community are kind of you know everyone's influenced by the flow and everyone's going with the flow um and trying to do islam as well um but sometimes many years can go by where you know life has seemed to be quite it's going along and it's going along quite easily and and suddenly you know 20 years later it's like well what do i actually know what have i actually learned um so it also requires a an awareness of the passing of time and actually it's not that easy to reach a level of hikma and i think we can see that in again the fracturing of 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 uh, of uh the families that that are happening in the community um or the in you know, the difficult situations that people get into that they can't find their way out of because um you know that there's no one to turn to to get that wisdom from or they didn't develop that wisdom in themselves so so it requires kind of uh, concentration um i i think one of the points that was raised on the phone call as well and as you said regarding um respect and there being a lack of it in our society at the moment in this moment in time um as you said it is it is without shadow of doubt because of the fact that we haven't we have well, we haven't actively tried to reach this stage of hikma mm. on the point of entertainment of course we have narrations one well, narration i believe it's from imam kadam and it's also regarding the fact that imam says you know divide your life yeah. up into parts and he says devote one part to halal entertainment and you know halal pleasures because the, these halal pleasures will help you in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfilling your rights to your family and earning the risk and so on and so forth. So there is a place for entertainment in Islam and we don't want to, to be seen as some kind of Puritan, yeah. cool joy kind of uh, uh, people who, 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 who have no place for entertainment. Entertainment has its place. However, it is important that we, uh, that again, entertainment is not given more priority over the other things which are necessary. Mm-hmm. um and it shouldn't divert us away from our obligation and our things that we that we have no choice but to do in yeah. our lives that's one the other thing is of course the fact that um as you mentioned regarding the um 
the fact that uh, you know we haven't developed the wisdom in order to deal with you know how to uh, improve how to you know better our our own akhlaq how to uh, deal with with other people family issues so on and so forth um and of course you know i don't i don't want to mention any names to give them free publicity either but uh very well known uh, family conflict that's going on mm-hmm. um in the media at the moment um highlights the state of our community i mean obviously this is one example of it but it is something that's very common that um generally you have the husband who's stuck in the middle um and uh he has his wife and his mother and they uh and they're both uh in many in in most cases both of them or one of them um is being unreasonable yeah uh in terms of uh what he what any person physically mentally intellectually is yeah. actually capable of doing yeah and they either of them or in many cases both of them are expecting something from him which he cannot do um and that leads to all kinds of conflict and so yeah. on and so forth and 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 then it goes off over the media and then you and then we see and we see that the problem is the lack of wisdom from all parties regarding how to resolve the issue yeah. because there's no focus on resolve there's no focus on how can we solve the issue their focus is on either i want this yeah this is what i believe is my right yeah uh and to hell with everybody else or the focus is on well if this if this is you know how it is then we will break off the relation so we won't communicate mm. or we will um continue the relation but to, it will remain in such a stage of uncomfortableness that you know that it may as well have broken off so so this tells us and all of this is because of a lack of wisdom in yeah. how to deal with the issue of how the whole prophet now how how these people how the uh, people whom we're supposed to follow are teaching us to deal with this issue and it's of course it's very interesting to see that in when conflicts like this arise in Muslim communities there's never any reference to the fact that this is what the Quran says about yeah. how to do resolve a conflict this is what the holy prophet sallam said this is what the imam al-hasan said there's never any mention of this because we uh well we give lip service yeah. to 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 the holy prophet sallam and that we love him and we're celebrating his birthday and, but when it comes to important things in our life we never we never bring this up Yeah. and if somebody does actually bring it up then it's always there's always no practical application of that into our lives you know the holy prophet sallam uh, had all these things in his life the imam alayhi salam had these things in there how did they deal with uh, you know if we believe that they are the people whom we're supposed to be following then how did they deal with such challenges yeah. or how did they deal with these challenges if people came to them with these kind of challenges. Yeah. So uh, as the caller uh, very rightly pointed out that uh, the issue of respect, the issue of who has to be in what place, the issue of how does a person uh well, the issue of how expectations should be. All of these contribute because and the root cause of all of this is a lack of wisdom in making the decision. Yeah. is that when we're making this decision when we're trying to resolve this issue there's it isn't being done with wisdom it's being done either emotionally or it's being done on a whim or it's being done on the fact that i think i've been oppressed i think i've been um, you know put in this difficult situation and i want to remove myself from the situation with the best possible outcome for me mm. irrespective of what happens to anybody else irrespective of the feelings of other people irrespective of what other people also deserve and have a right to yeah so uh, in a way like you know i was mentioning about how um muslims who are in non-muslim societies or even in muslim societies really because uh, media is global now and and the system is global in a sense um kind of um go along with the flow or are just you know kind of adopting the 
methods and the akhlaq or whatever of, of whatever the local society happens to have. Um, and, and of course, especially in, in more materialistic societies, um, there can be, you know, the consciousness of, of the person um, is all to do with, um, like, my rights and, as you say, to hell with everybody else. Um, and, you know, um, and, and, and as you say, unrealistic expectations. Now, this strange mix of religious and very materialistic expectations that often families have as well, this kind of impossible mix that, you know, they want all the ticks, that the boxes tick. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, this is a prime example, really, of how desperately we need to turn back to the Holy Prophet. Absolutely. Um, I think in, on the issue of materialism, on the issue of, um, of, of, of being attached to this world, or con this consumerist issue that, it, well, that even non-Muslim people in this society acknowledge and, and, and realise. Yeah. I think, um, again, reading an article once that uh, a, a, a young lady had done a test that she'd spent 200 days without buying anything new. Right. Um, and she said, because I didn't need anything. And it shows that most of the time when we buy something new, we don't absolutely really urgently need it. It's only or a few occasions when, you know, something is absolutely that we need yeah. that we go and buy something. But because we live in consumerist society and, you know, the way that our towns and cities, for example, are built is that the way, you know, passing by will go past the shops or will go past something or nowadays you go online and you see something and you're like, oh, I like that, let's get that. Mm. And I don't really need it, but I, I don't, because I'm an, I'm an impulse, because I've been impulsed into buying it, either because I saw it, or I passed by it, or somebody told me about it, or so on and so forth. So, so that, that again, is the lack of wisdom yeah. that we're not reflecting over, that when I don't need it, why am I being impulsed into buying something? Why am I being impulsed into, into doing something? These, the, all of these things would help when we help reflect over them that oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says, you know, he's promised you for risk that he's going to give you whatever you need. Not yeah. every single impulse that I, that I have. Thank you very much. And uh, some good realistic points there. Uh, we're just about to go to another break. Do feel free again to call in. Inshallah, we'll see you again in a few minutes. Muhammad, and welcome back to Ahl al-Bayt Live, where we are remembering the birth of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny. And we are looking at him as a model of akhlaq, and again, reminding ourselves of what we can learn from his personality and of course we seek his intercession um, to assist us uh, with reaching you know the levels that we want to reach inshallah um, just to turn to some of the actual points from the holy quran that we can see uh, that were um, you know that have been stated we can see how the holy prophet again peace be upon him and progeny as a as an embodiment of the holy quran um, changed certain things in Arab society at the time. Um, the very famous issue of um, the, a man being compassionate and loving to his children, so that's that famous narration where, um, you know, he was being affectionate to a child and it was kind of remarked upon and, and he said, if I don't have mercy, then, you know, who, um, Allah doesn't have mercy upon those who don't have mercy. Um, so it was unusual for that time for a man to show tenderness towards his children. It's probably seen as kind of unmanly. And many values that he, um, he practiced uh, were, were not considered kind of manly virtues at the time. Forgiveness, gentleness, kindness. Um, and uh, also uh, he brought in um, the idea or, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, again, introduced into the society 
this idea that our merit is down to our individual character, our individual akhlaq. Um, our merit is not exclusively drawn upon our lineage or our tribe as it was uh, then, which is very interesting. This is kind of a fundamental change um, in the society. Um, and of course, famously introducing um, tolerance and forgiveness as virtues. Um, so as the Holy Quran says in Surah Araf, verse 199, take to forgiveness and enjoy good and turn aside from the ignorant. Um, and uh, other uh, beautiful things here, such as do not spy on one another. Um, do not enter any houses except your own homes unless you're sure of the occupant's consent. This kind of sounds obvious now because we've got locks on our doors, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but what it is doing, which is quite interesting, is introducing this idea of privacy, respecting someone's privacy, respecting someone's, uh, you know, space, um, respecting um, their, you know, their life, their reputation, you don't go investigating and digging up things to spread about people as we've just been talking now. And this seems to be still so much, you know, so relevant. We still find, um, again, um, in society, people who, um, and often very sweetly, they will kind of, in a surreptitious way, extract information from someone. They'll befriend someone to extract information from it and then go and spread something to to someone else and uh, and this again is all creating um, a society that is, is keeping itself down really you know we are keeping ourselves down by engaging uh, abso in absolutely I think um, as you mentioned about forgiveness earlier um, the, the Holy Prophet Islam on the day of the march of the Muslims to back to Mecca in the eighth year after Hijrah um, some of the Muslims commented and they said um, today is the day of revenge and the Holy Prophet of Islam corrected them and said today is not the day of revenge today is the day of mercy because I am the Prophet of mercy um, and that shows that mercy or being kind to people or forgiving people is not a weakness it's yeah. a strength and in, in rather revenge and anger and uh, you know oppressing people these are weaknesses not yeah. Uh, uh, traditionally, we we uh, uh, associate or we think of forgiveness or being merciful to people as a weakness. Oh, this person is being no. It's actually a, a, the st a strength because the Holy Prophet Islam uh, demonstrated to us that this is the strength. This is the strength that I was merciful to people, and therefore they accepted Islam on their own volition. I didn't march in there and say everybody has to become a Muslim, otherwise they're going to kill you. Yeah. As people are doing in the Holy Prophet yes. Islam's name today. But the Holy Prophet Islam, he, he said, I'm the Prophet of Mercy. So I've come here and said, okay, whoever goes into the Kaaba, whoever goes here, whoever stays in their own house, they will be saved. Right? And then people will start becoming Muslims. They see the, the, the impact that religion of Islam has had on the lives of the people who have become Muslims. Yeah. Um, and interesting point of regarding, uh, regarding privacy, as you said, um, from the Quran about do not enter other people's houses. I, I remember... Um, Having once having a conversation about um, when blogging uh, started coming out, and I remember once having a conversation with a friend saying, you know, I remember when we were growing up um, that uh, it, those of us who wrote diaries were very, uh, very keen to, to to guard our privacy what, yeah. what, what we'd written in our diaries, um, and now we have blogging where we're actually telling everybody yeah. in our whole life. So how different it's become from where yeah. there was a time where we didn't want people to know and now we're actually actively doing things to, to, to make people know. Um, and similarly with, you know, sharing photos and, 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 and the like, that, you know, we, we kept our albums very private and we only showed people who wanted to show. Yeah. Whereas now we, um, we post it on Facebook and Instagram for everyone to know. Um, so we have become, we have changed, you know, we've, we've given up or we've, very subtly being forced to give up our privacy in order to become accepted in society, yeah. you know, because social media has now been, become the barometer of how acceptable I am in society, how popular I am in society, how, um, you know, if, if, it, if, it ha if it happened and you don't post it on Facebook, it doesn't happen. Yeah. If you didn't post it on social media, it means you, 
you, you didn't go to this place, you didn't do this, you didn't, you know, and if you didn't take but any or, pictures... Or, or if you don't post up things about your personal life, but you're just posting things to do with articles or politics, um, then it's considered that, um, you know, you're, you're not kind of fitting in with the in crowd who are sharing everything about their kids, yeah. their events, their holidays, and, and you're not doing that. No, well, you're, not, you're not joining in, like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and, um, absolutely, you know. absolutely. So, so I think all, all, those, all these things are a reminder of how it has affected our lives, even if we, you know, and, and, and even for those of us who perhaps don't participate in, in these mainstream social media circles, we still have WhatsApp and we still have other things that, you know, in terms of instant communication, which we which involve us and bring us into this fold of, of, of social media. So that, of course, is one thing. And then regarding, um, regarding modesty, regarding um, how to, uh, you know, do not spy on one another, for example, how to behave with one another, how parents and children should behave with one another, yeah. how husband and wife should behave with one All these things are things that we've, <coughs> we've put and we, we believe in and we say this is in the Holy Quran, this is in the practice of the Holy Prophet. But when it comes to our practical lives, we see very little of it being even spoken about when yeah. in moments of conflict, in moments of issues, how to resolve it. it. How many times do we see that, you know, a verse of the Holy Quran is referred to or a hadith of the Holy Prophet or a story from the Holy Prophet? How is that? Life is mentioned that this is the solution to this problem. This is the solution to this issue. No, rather than that, in, instead of these things, we say, oh, no, well, we can't live like them, or we, you know, don't... We'll, and therefore, we do an emotional judgment. We keep the Holy Prophet, Islam, the Qur'an, very high up in the shelves. But yeah. when it comes to dealing and answering our solution uh, problems in life and providing us solutions, we don't refer to it. We don't go to it. You know, and the, the Qur'an itself says that, you know, the Holy Prophet will complain that the, this community of mine, they went away from the Holy mm. Qur'an. That means that we, not, we went away from it physically, we won't have it in the houses, we won't have it the, yeah. on the shelves, but we don't, we don't open it and act upon yeah. what, the, what the Qur'an is telling us to do. So, all such things, um, you know, in summary, are, is, are really the 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 reason why we have to come back, reflect over the life mm. of the Holy Prophet Islam on his birthday and say that how close am I to the model of akhlaq brought by the Holy Prophet Islam. And if I am not, then let me take this, at least this opportunity at this time when we're remembering and speaking about the Holy Prophet Islam to Reflect over that yeah. to see how can I better, how can I take, uh, I, always, I always say that sometimes one of the tricks of shaitan is that we bring this excuse for ourselves and we say, well, it's so bad or we're so far gone that we cannot, yeah. you know, there's no way of doing anything. No, these are the tricks of shaitan. We should look at this embodiment of akhlaq of the Holy Prophet Islam and say, I'm going to take one thing in my life and change it. Whether that's one thing positive that I'm going to add to my life or one negative thing which I'm going to remove from my life. And just start with that yeah. and make it a consistent thing that I'm going to focus on this one thing that I need to fix. Because everybody has their own challenges, everybody has their own struggles. And uh, if I take one thing and I fix that, then it will have domino effect. It will be able to fix other things mm -hmm. in my life. Famous story, the Bedouin came to the Holy Prophet Islam and he said to him that I'm willing to accept your religion, but I'm only willing to change one thing in my life. So the Holy Prophet Islam said to him, don't tell a lie. And he went away thinking this is very easy. And then he uh, wanted to go and do some haram act of I don't know, stealing, and then he thought to himself, if I steal this thing and then I wear it and I go to the Prophet and he asks me, where did you get this from? I will have to tell him the truth and then mm -hmm. I will be embarrassed. So he left that and then he 
wanted to go and consume alcohol, and then he thought to himself, if I go there and then I go to the Prophet, and he says, where are you coming from? Then I'll have to say where I'm coming from, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And then eventually he comes to the Prophet, and he says that, uh, you told me to leave one evil thing, and as a result of that, I left all of these things. So that means, and so this way of taking one thing and changing it in your life is the way, it, I didn't make this up, the Holy Prophet of Islam mm -hmm. taught us, this is how you, you don't tell a person, oh, you have to change one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things, he's going to think, there's no chance this is yeah. going to happen. You go, change this one thing in your life. Let's change this thing, one thing in my life. And then see how that domino affects everything else and improves other things in my life mm. as well. So if we focus on the realistic goals, realistic things, well, the realistic thing is one thing in my life. That's very realistic. I can say that today, after watching this program, I'm going to uh, make a promise to the whole Prophet of Islam that on your birthday, I'm going to change one thing in my life. Mm. I'm going yes. to bring one addition, one positive addition into my life, or I'm going to remove one negative thing from my life. I'm, e I'm going to, you know, whether it's to do with ibadat, it's to do with behavior, whether it's to do with, you know, I'm going to improve relations with my family members, I'm going to pray on time, I'm going to go to Hajj this year, so on and so mm. forth. Or it's to remove some evil thing. Okay, I'm not, if I was not doing hijab, I'm going to do hijab. If I didn't have a beard, I'm going to have a beard. If I didn't, you know, uh, if I listen to music, I'm going to stop listening to music. If I was doing riba, I'm going to stop doing ribas. Whatever it might yeah. be, you know, what, whatever common uh, evil trait that I have in myself, because I know myself better than anybody else. So I know that this is one thing that I am able to identify and eliminate from my life for the sake of the Holy Prophet Islam and for the sake of his uh, birthday and his remembrance. I'm going to take this opportunity to remove this thing from my life. That is a realistic way of looking at how to embody akhlaq with wisdom into my own life mm -hmm. and it's all good well and good talking about it but how do i embody that yeah. and implement that into my own life into my own day-to-day -day practice so that every day when i wake up in the morning i say i'm trying i am a follower of the holy prophet of islam sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa and that is a big responsibility that means that i have to try and live the, my life with the values of the Holy Prophet وسلم, in my life. So every day that I wake up in the morning, I, this is the first thing that I think about. And then I do whatever I need to do in my life. You yeah. know, when we say like, I don't leave the house without brushing my teeth, right? I might leave the house without having breakfast, but I will never leave the house without brushing my mm. teeth. So just like I wake up early enough to make sure that I brush my teeth, I wake up uh, five minutes earlier than that and say I'm going to reflect over the Holy Prophet Islam that I'm a follower of the Holy Prophet Islam and I want to I try to embody his values into my life. I'm going to reflect on that for five minutes. That's it. Mm. And then go out and do everything that I need to do in that day. But throughout the day, I'm still reflecting over those five minutes that I did in the morning that I I'm a follower of the Holy Prophet Islam, and I need to make sure that I am living that as my life. Not that I am going out and going into the dunya and being a part of the dunya yeah. and forgetting about the fact that I'm a follower of the, of the Holy Prophet Islam, except for the fact that maybe when the time for Salat comes and I'll pray, and then I'll go back to being part of the dunya again. And I'll, I'm just a drone or a, or, or a, or a clone yeah. of, of, of this of this corporate machinery that, that we're all part of, unfortunately. Yeah. But if I have in my mind that, yes, I, I have to be part of this because I have no choice. But I am a follower of the Holy Prophet and his al and therefore I have a responsibility separate from other people. And that is that I have to try and embody his values into my life uh, if I really, truly love him and want to follow him and want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, if you want Allah to love you, if you claim that Allah, that you love Allah, then follow the Holy Prophet of Islam, yeah. and then Allah will love you and he will forgive your sins. So, um, your commandment is very clear, that 
without following the Holy Prophet Islam, without living life in accordance with his commands, there's no way to towards success. This yeah. is the only way. Therefore, this is something that I should seriously be reflecting on every single day. And to, if I haven't already been doing that, then I take this opportunity of the milad of the Holy Prophet Islam to reflect yeah. on it uh, from today onwards. That tomorrow, from tomorrow morning, I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to reflect over this point and make sure that's my life. And then when I come home, I'm going to reflect on it again is that, and say how many, how, which percentage of my day was spent, was acting the message of the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and which percentage was not. And then that way, when I'm reflecting in the morning and the evening, then I'll be able to, after some days, find out, find that my percentage is going up, that I am actively trying yeah. to embody the message of the Holy Prophet Islam in my life. Yeah, it becomes, a, it becomes an active uh, practice rather than a passive practice, because I think once you get into that passivity, then that's when things start to kind of slip. Um, and I guess, again, like you say, the point you make about having the whole of Quran on the, on the shelf, but living life kind of um, away from that, it's almost like there's a thought in the back of the mind that, um, that, that doesn't trust that, you know, the values and ethics of the Holy Qur'an can actually resolve um, issues. It, it's kind of like, well, yeah, it's there, I know it's there, but, <laughs> you know, this is the way I want to do it. Um, and as you say, which is often following immediate needs or immediate expectations or fears um, as well. Uh, and again, this leads to all kinds of difficult situations that people get themselves into and unhappinesses as well because um, people are not being just to each other um, you know I think a lot of the unhappiness that that happens in society is because someone somewhere feels that they haven't been treated justly they've been spoken to unjustly or treated unjustly um, in other ways and this creates anger and resentment and you know fracturing of relations um, as well so um, you know, again, if we did go back to uh, the, you know, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his Holy Progeny was, was balanced, he was self-possessed. Um, I remember Imam Zain al-Abadin, salam, you know, <clears throat> saying that, again, the sign of a mu'min is that when he's happy, he's not excessive, i.e. I. doesn't go into foolish behaviour. When he's angry, he's not excessive. Again, I'm paraphrasing here, but doesn't go into yeah. foolish behaviour either. So, um, it's, you know, again, if we did kind of trust that actually, no, this can help to resolve these issues in my life, then, then we would go back to it. But I think people are kind of, well, yeah, it's there, but it doesn't really refer to me. And, you know, this is the way I'm doing things and I'm in my rut and I'm in my kind of... Uh, Absolutely. So, so some reflection, you know, just five minutes every morning and then five minutes every evening. Uh, 10 minutes in 24 hours uh, is uh, is not a lot to, mm. to to do. But that five minutes in the morning or five minutes in the evening will help me to reflect over this fact that, yes, if I'm calling myself Muslim, a follower of the Holy Prophet Islam and his Ahlul Bayt Islam, then what am I doing to to live that as in my life? Is it just lip service? Am I just saying the fact that I follow him, but I don't really, this is, uh, this will, you know, be resolved yeah. if I, you know, reflect over that, uh, you know, continue mm. to reflect over it. Um, and of course, you know, well, when we, we, we've spoken about the, the, the philosophy of akhlaq and, you know, the, the basis of it and the reasoning behind it, but of course the things that we usually uh, associate with akhlaq regarding, you know, being good to people yeah. and, uh, you know, using good language and good words and so on and so forth. Th these are obviously also part of akhlaq. We, do, we don't limit akhlaq to that, but these things are also important. Um, the Holy Prophet of Islam, for example, always used to uh, speak uh, good words yeah. to everyone. He, and Ayyam Alayhi Wasallam, of course, as well, would show us that even to a person who doesn't speak, good word to you. You know, this is, this is the challenging part. Yeah. 
Because if someone is nice to me, then it's easy for me to be nice to them. But Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Ayyam Alayhi Wasallam are saying, no, you have to, that's not the challenge. You're obviously going to be nice to people who are nice yeah. to you. The challenge is to be nice to people who are not nice to you. To, be, to speak good words to people who are swearing at you, who are being evil. Yeah. That's the challenge. And that, when they did it, showed us that, yes, we obviously speak good words to people who are good to us. But we also, we don't change, we don't lower our standards mm. uh, just because the person in front of me is sorry. No, because I might have say this is our standard. Whether you do good to us or you do evil to us, whether you're uh, going to come and swear at us or you're going to try and kill us or you're going to try and torture us or give us oppression or give us pain or give us a hard time, we're still going to s yeah. make sure our standard of how we speak to people is the same. Yeah. And that is the challenge. That, you know, it's very easy and we all... There, there can't be a worse person who is not nice to people who are nice to him. But to be nice to people who are not nice to you, who, to be, have good akhlaq to people who don't have good akhlaq, this is the challenge. Yeah. And this is the seal of the Holy Prophet of Islam. You know, famous story when the woman threw rubbish at him. If it was some, any one of us, we would have, um, you know... Retaliated. Retaliated, or, and mm. when the rubbish was not coming, we would have thought, oh... Thank God it's, it's not happening anymore. Yeah. But some people might have picked up something and thrown right, it at <laughs> throw it, thrown it back. But for it to stop for three days and the Prophet وسلم, to inquire, uh, you know, what's wrong with yeah. her. And then to go and visit her. It's show, in, this is a practical thing. Yeah. That we, and it's a story that we're all aware of. It's just to reflect over the fact that when the Holy Prophet Islam went there, she thought he was like him. Because she said, you've chosen a good time to take your revenge. Mm -hmm. And the Prophet said, I haven't come to take revenge, I've just come to find out how you are. So he's, he's showing us through this particular action of uh, the fact that akhlaq is that I go and find out and inquire about even those people. Unfortunately, we're, we're in a time where if, if uh, one of my relatives or one of my friends becomes ill, I don't yes. have time to go and visit yes. them. Yes. Unfortunately, yeah. right? that, you know, let alone if somebody who I don't like becomes unwell, somebody I don't like becomes unwell, I'd probably say, good, he became unwell, and good, he's in hospital. Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but it's instinctive reaction. That's my enough speaking, yeah. saying, oh, thank God he's, he's mm. in hospital. At least he's out of my way. But uh, even for people who we know, unfortunately, even for people who we know and people it's who true. are our relatives, we don't have time. We, oh, I don't have time to go and phone them and say, oh, I hope you're, you, yeah. you're, you, you feel better soon. And we don't go to see them. But there's a virtue, the Holy Prophet is saying, in going to see somebody yes. who, is, who is unwell, who is sick. Because just, just maybe the fact that you went to see them might make that person feel better. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's a psychological point as much as it being a point regarding akhla as well. And right. actually, visiting um, is is again highly encouraged um, in Islam. And I think again, you know, this is this is very challenging for people who are living now in big cities. Um, Absolutely. And even families are falling Absolutely. into this. It used to be just friends, like you see them. Yes, you know, inshallah, we'll see each other, and it never happens. And now it's families. Yes, inshallah, we'll see each other, and it never happens. Um, so, you know, and I think this was actually a, a resolution that I made to myself last year because I was thinking every, every Muharram and every month of Ramadan, you meet everybody, yes, inshallah, we must see each other soon, and you don't see them again six months later or the next Muharram later. And last year I was like, no, I am not going to just say this, I'm going to actually do something about it. So, okay, I didn't visit a lot of people, but, you know, there was a, some people that... Um, I went to visit, alhamdulillah. and uh, alhamdulillah, and, it, and you know, uh, just one small thing, you know, that, that can Absolutely. change our lives. Absolutely. So I want to thank you, Sayyid Safar Abbas, for thank some you. very good points and good analysis, um, and I hope that was helpful to uh, our audience. Inshallah, I will be uh, back tomorrow for another program on the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his holy progeny. Uh, inshallah, we'll see you same time tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad. 
Ahlul Bayt TV, the holy household for every household.